So uh, I'm Joe Collins, and I want to welcome you to See Me Church this morning. It's great to have you here. And uh, sorry about that. We're trying to deal with a number of technical issues all at the same time here. So you uh, are, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do these slides today. So I apologize. So anyways, I'm Joe Collins. Uh, thanks for joining us today. As you know, we've been in a study on Revelations. Now I don't know where my glasses are. All right. Sorry about that. So anyways, as you know, we've been in a study of Revelation, and last time we looked at Revelation chapter 5 through, uh, Ch Revelation chapter 8, sorry, verses 5 through 9, and we learned that God's judgment of Rome, like Egypt before, and all earthly empires since, including our own the United States, was and is due in part because of the prayers of both the faithful dead and the living, and in part because of those empires' refusal to repent. That was the big revelation we got last week, that empire is going to constantly, empires, human empires, earthly empires are going to come and go, and they're going to constantly refuse to repent, including our very own empire that we live in today, the United States. Which is why, as we're going to see today from Revelation chapter 10, the gospel still needs to be preached. Amen. Now, as always, my goal is to grow your faith and love for God and neighbor. Now, go ahead and stand with me as we have done every uh, week uh, since chapter four of this series. We are going to say the Pledge of Allegiance, not to the United States or any other country, but to our almighty, all-holy, and all-merciful God. So repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the God of heaven and earth. I pledge allegiance to God of heaven and holy, earth. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Is the Lord God almighty. Is the Lord God almighty. Who was... And is and is, to come. Was, and is and is to come. You are merciful, you are merciful. Holy. holy, and worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. And worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things. For you created all things. And by your will, by your will they, were they were created and have their being. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Thank you. Revelation chapter 10, if you have your phone on or a Bible in front of you, you can open up your Bible app or, the, or your phone uh, to uh, Revelation chapter 10. And we are going to start reading in verse 1. It says, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun. His legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the, thunder, and when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. Then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, the sea and the sea and all that is in it and said, there will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his seven, to his servant, servants, the prophets. Then the voice I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go, take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me a, the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your, in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. 
Then I was told you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. So as we have learned previously, the message of the seven trumpets that we are discussing right now in this part of Revelation is basically the same as the message of the seven seals. And that, and just as there was an interlude between the opening of the sixth and seventh seal, there's also an interlude between the sounding of the sixth and seventh trumpets. Now, while the former, the, the, the interlude be, uh, between the sixth and seventh seals, while that was designed to reassure John, his listeners, and the faithful, uh, and his listeners that the faithful dead and living had nothing to fear from the Roman Empire or God's coming judgment of it, the latter, what we're talking about today, the, the interlude between the sixth and seventh trumpet, reminded John, his listeners, and more importantly, all listeners anywhere, anytime, including you and I, that in spite of the cycle of conquest, war, pestilence, and death, followed by God's judgment, we still have work to do. Specifically, in verse 11, he said, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. In other words, regardless of whatever empire, whatever earthly empire is in charge at anywhere and at any time, including the one we currently live in, the United States, the gospel still needs to be preached. Amen. There's never a time when it shouldn't be preached. So with that in mind, we're going to take a closer look at the imagery and the symbolism here of this chapter. But I, I start with the point at the beginning because I don't want you to get distracted by all the imagery and the symbolism. Because Revelation 10, in fact, the whole book of Revelation, a lot like a parable, is designed to communicate a specific message, a specific point. And when you read a, a parable, the goal is not to get caught up in the details of the parable. The goal is to understand the point of the parable, the story behind the parable, the message behind the parable. Well, the same is true of Revelation. The point is to understand the message behind the story. And we have to accept that Revelation is written in a very unique literary style. We've talked about this many times, Jewish apocalyptic literature. It involves a lot of signs and symbols and, and events that are very uh, vivid and colorful and they're very dramatic. But all of that is just to emphasize the point, the story, the message. It's not meant to break down each little description and try to find connections uh, either in the present time or the future or in the past. It's really meant to communicate one message. Once you get the message, then you can go back and maybe make some connections with the symbolism, which is what we're gonna do in just a minute. But it's important that we know the message and the message of Revelation 10 is that the gospel needs to be preached regardless of what empire is, going, is in charge at the time, regardless of what's happening in the world at the time, the gospel needs to be preached. So I'm going to go through it kind of one verse at a time. Verse 1, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun, and his legs were like fiery pillars. Now in verse 1, John sees this enormous angel. I mean, he's, just think about the imagery of that, the, the magnitude. The, the, this angel is so big that he can stand with one foot on the land and one on the sea. This is a, this is a colossus angel here, if you're into AOT. Right? That's what this is. This is a massive angel. But... It's interesting because even though it says another mighty angel, it would, make you, it would lead you to believe that it's just an angel. But really, the, uh, the rest of the description here, robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head, face like a sun, legs like fiery pillars, who does that remind you of? That makes you think of Jesus. And the word angel really means messenger. 
So we could be, John could be describing Jesus here. I, I personally think he is. It doesn't matter either way. But we have this image of Jesus or this mighty angel standing on the earth. In other words, he is in charge. He is large and in charge. Now in verse 2, this angel was holding a little scroll, which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left on the land. Now, where do you think of scroll? Well, if you remember earlier in Revelation chapter 6, there was a scroll that the one on the throne was holding had, six, had seven seals on it. This is probably a reference back to that scroll. It's not another scroll. It's a reference back to that scroll. It's just changed a little bit. John does that a lot, right? He takes, he takes references from the Old Testament. He takes references from some of his earlier points he made in the book, and he kind of reuses them later, but they're sort of different, like a Picasso. It's like an abstraction. It's not meant to mean anything dramatically symbolic. There's nothing, no, no, no real hidden secret meaning there about the little scroll. It's just really a reference to the scroll we've already read. Maybe it's little because in this vision, Jesus is so enormous. I, I don't know. But we notice that it's a little scroll and it's opened because it was already opened. When we read about the seven seals, that scroll opened. Okay, so it's a reference back to the scroll. Who here remembers what the scroll was? from a couple lessons ago. No one, that's okay. So the scroll represented the will of God. It was the testimony, the testament, right? It's the, it's the new covenant will of God. Remember, it was, in the, it was in the one on the throne in God the Father's hand and it was sealed and John wept because no one was found worthy to open it until Jesus, the slain lamb, opened it. And then there was joy because God's will has now been revealed. It's now available. It's now open. But what we discover is that God's will involves conquest, war, pestilence, famine, death, and then judgment. Like that's the future of mankind as God was revealing it to John. So it's, it's not the best story it's great that there's a will and that there's a way in which people can be saved and brought to faith, but it's going to come with a lot of other tragedy as a part of it. <laughs> so that's the reference to the little scroll. And in verse, uh, in verse uh, uh, three, it says, he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. Now the word, the number seven, symbolic for perfection. In other words, this, this reference to the voice of a lion and, and then sounding like seven thunders is just a way of saying this is God speaking. That's all that is. God is making a statement here. Jesus is going to say something. But before John could write down what Jesus said. Now remember, the whole book of Revelation, at the beginning of the book, John was told to write down what you see in here. So John is doing his job. He's, he's been recording everything very diligently. And now he's about to do the same thing, write down what Jesus is saying to the world. And he's told, no, don't write it down. Now we're going to find out why in just a second. But it's kind of interesting that all of a sudden John is told, don't write this down. I think it's for effect. It's, it's to make you go, wait a second, why is he not supposed to write this down? It makes you want to read more. What's going on here? That's the purpose of that. So we go on to verse 5. Then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven. In other words, he's, he's making an oath here. He's swearing before God. And in verse 6, he says... And he swore to him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, the sea and all that is in it, and said, there will be no more delay. Why was the scroll, well, I mean, why was John told not to write down what he saw and heard? Because it had already been revealed and it was now actually happening. There was no need to write it down because it was happening. Jesus' pronouncement on the world is happening. 
It was happening in John's day and it's happening in our day. Jesus's judgment of human empire is always happening. Jesus's judgment of human behavior is always happening. We don't need to write it down anymore. We already know that. It's very clear. In other words, the message of the seven seals and seven trumpets was in the, in the context of Revelation that God's judgment of Rome and by extension all subsequent, all subsequent Romes, including our own, the United States, was not only going to happen, it was already happening. This is what God does. He judges. That should cause you a little anxiety. It should cause you to kind of think about yourself for a minute. God is judging. He is watching. He's observing. He's seeing. He sees all. He knows all the thoughts and attitudes of your own heart. He knows everything and he is the judge. Now, even though I'm a Christian and I have sincerely put my faith in Jesus and been baptized and sincerely repented of my sin and continue to repent of my sin, that still causes me some anxiety because I am still a sinner. Imagine what it would cause someone who has not put their faith in Jesus not repented of their sin, and not been baptized. You would hope that it would cause them maybe even more anxiety. <laughs> Unfortunately, not everybody feels the same, but that's kind of the message here. God is judging. He's always judging. So as a result of God's judgment, verse 7 says, but in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Something called the mystery of God will be accomplished. So what is the mystery? Now, all of a sudden, we're into a mystery story here. It started out with this amazing image of Jesus and this Colossus Jesus on the, on the earth, and he's making this pronouncement, and we're finding out that he's the judge, and he's always judging, and his judgments are already happening, but now there's a mystery. In the process of God judging the earth, his, something is being accomplished. His, the mystery of God is being accomplished. So what is the mystery of God? Does anybody want to take a guess? Heaven? Heaven? Good guess. Anyone else? Yes, Daniel? The apocalypse, good guess. Anyone else? The gospel. The gospel. Anyone else? Salvation. Salvation. The cross. The cross. Mm -hmm. Well, before we find out, there's something more that we need to know. In verse 8, then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. And in verse 9, he tells him to eat it. Now, if you know your scriptures, Ezekiel had to do something similar. God gave him a scroll and told him to eat it. What is the imagery there? What is the, the uh, point there of having him eat the scroll? It becomes a part of it. That's exactly right. Daniel? Reflection. Reflection. That, that's true. Someone else said something over here. Was it you, Shannon? Ingesting. Ingesting the word. Yeah, the, the point of that is to internalize the message. The message of that scroll has got to be internalized. You've got to own it. But then in verse 10, when John does so, it goes in sweet, but it turns his stomach sour. In other words, whatever this mystery was, 
the mystery of God that's going to be accomplished, whatever it was, or whatever it is, it's also bittersweet. It's a tough message. It's a hard message. So if we step back now and we take a look at all of Revelation 10 and we ask ourselves, what's happening here? Well, the short answer, or the tongue-in-cheek answer, is that Revelations isn't done. We're only at chapter 10. There's actually 12 more chapters to go. And so John has more, 12, has more work to do. He's got to write 12 more chapters. And that is kind of true. In this vision, God gave John the little scroll to eat. In other words, he's now got something he's got to say. So he's got more work to do. But really, the more serious answer is that God is not done in Revelation 10. Because there are still more peoples, nations, languages, and kings yet to hear the gospel. In other words, there's more work to do. It didn't end. Our work as Christians, John's work, his listeners, all listeners anywhere at any time, including you and I, our work is not done. There is more work to do. There are more people that have to hear the gospel. The only question is, how? How is it that this gospel, how is, it, how is the gospel going to be spread? How is the word going to get out? And that is the mystery. That's the bittersweet mystery. And I really want to talk about it. Because it is, it is maybe the most poignant and important part of Revelation yet. Today. But unfortunately, you're going to have to wait for two weeks. Because I'm going to end on a cliffhanger. You don't get to know what that mystery is just yet. The mystery of how the gospel is going to be preached. I'm putting it on hold. Because for today, I want to focus on the point of the chapter. And that point is that the gospel still needs to be preached. Amen. Amen. Apocalypse is coming. Judgment day is at hand. The wrath of the Lord of the Lamb is occurring even today. It's happening. All around the world, it is happening. People are dying in their sin. Nations are raging against the Lord. Kingdoms have turned their back on the king. People are denying Jesus as Lord. They're refusing to repent of their sin. They need the chance to repent. They need the opportunity to hear the gospel. That is the message of today's lesson. That is why we're putting the mystery on hold for a minute. How? How are we going to do that? We'll talk about that in two weeks. But right now, the only thing I want you to hear, the only thing I want you to know from today's message is that there are people in your life who are facing an apocalypse, the judgment of God, the wrath of the Lamb, and they will die in that state if you don't tell them the gospel. If you don't preach to them, who will? Amen. They need to hear the message. Amen. And as crazy as it may seem, God chose you and I to tell them. That's the message for today. That's the only point I have. That's the whole lesson right there. It's our job to tell our world about Jesus Christ. Because judgment is at hand. It's not, oh, I'll get to it later. No, no. It's happening. The colossal Jesus has announced it to the world. 
It is happening. You and I have to swallow the scroll. We have to internalize the message. It has to become so much a part of us that it becomes who we are. Bearers of the good news of Jesus Christ to the lost world that we interact with. John's work wasn't done, and neither is yours, and neither is mine. So, as we close out today, instead of taking communion at this moment and having a chance to share what we got out of the message, I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to ask that we partner up, wherever we are, maybe in each row or whatever. If you're alone, scoot over to someone. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to talk about the people in your world that you need to witness to, that you need to talk to. Who are those people? You guys know as a, as a congregation, we have what we call our oikos, our, uh, our little cards that we give everyone where you can write down the names of those people family, friends, neighbors, you put their names down and you pray for, you invest in, and you invite to church on a regular basis and prepare yourself to be the witness you need to be for them, right? That's what this is all about. So Aria has some extra cards. If people don't have one, just put your hand up. She's going to give you one because I'd love you to take one if you don't have one. But what I'd like to do for the next five minutes is ask you to keep your hand up so Aria can find you. What I'd like to do is ask you, is in just a minute, to sit down and go through the names. Who are they? Who are these people? Maybe share with each other who they are. And then we're going to take a minute we're going to pray for them. Because that's the first step. And then I'm going to remind you and encourage you that the next step is to start investing in them and inviting them to church. And then continue to be the Christian you need to be for God and them. So... Get a card, group up, take five minutes, talk about who those people are, take a minute to pray for them, then we'll come back up and we'll close out with communion. At this time, we are going to take communion. I really appreciate everyone uh, doing that exercise with me because, again, what we're talking about here is life and death issues, right? We're talking about Judgment Day, Apocalypse, the wrath of the Lamb, and people's need to hear the gospel. And we have a part to play in that. It is our mission to internalize the message and then to share it with everyone in our path, our oikos, our family, friends, and neighbors. So I hope you guys, uh, like me, I... Just about every day I pray over my oikos and think about all the people that are on it and, and, and pray for them. And I hope you're doing the same. And then the, the next step is to try to figure out how to invest and then invite them out to church. All right. That said, at Simi Church, we believe the Bible is the best source of truth in our world today. In it, we learn Jesus is Lord. He lived a sinless life, died on a cross and rose to life again. And it's in this belief that we do everything. So at this time, go ahead and take communion if you have it with you. I'll give you a minute to pray to God and connect with him in remembrance of his life, death, burial, Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection. And then I'll say a prayer and we will close out.
Amen. Father, thank you so very much for bringing us together this morning, for loving us in spite of us, for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for us, and then giving us the gift of the Holy Spirit. As we take this communion time together, uh, take communion and have this time together, I do pray that we, each of us, renew our covenant we made with you at our baptism, and that we remember you and your sacrifice. We're so grateful for Jesus and what you've done for all of us, and we pray that we can be conduits to bring that message to the people we love. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. So we want to be uh, your church, your family's church, and your neighbor's church. To learn more, just ask the person who told you about us or check us out online. Don't forget to click like and subscribe. If you like what we're doing here at Simi Church, please consider supporting us. We are a member-supported fellowship. You can give today by texting GIVE to 888-403-4203, or you can go online at simi.church. A couple of quick announcements. This coming Sunday is our Oxnard Beach Park worship service, so we will not be here this Sunday, but we will be out at Oxnard, and we'll be fellowshipping with the Santa Barbara Church, the Soroline Church, the Valley Church, and, of course, our church, Simi Church. We're going to have a great time together. I believe it starts at 930, so we want to be there at 9. You do have to pay for parking. I think it's cash only. Um, and then I think Lynette has sent out emails to everyone about doing food as kind of one big group. Everybody bring different things, and we'll just have a big uh, spread after the service is over and just enjoy some great fellowship out there at the beach uh, and, and with our brothers and sisters from our other, our other ministries. Also, this Friday, 730, there is a Junior High Legends devotional, and uh, there's all the information, of course, is on our is on our website. As always, I want to remind you to pray for, invest in, and invite the church, your family, friends, and neighbors, and prepare yourself to be the best you can be for God and them. God bless, and enjoy the rest of your Sunday.